and welcome to Computer Graphics. So what are we doing today? We're talking about shading today and lighting today. And I thought I would spend a few seconds here and uh, look at the assignments. We have unanimously decided that you're only going to have to do three of the five. So complete three of the five assignments. And uh, the first assignment I've gone over already, that one was the hills and the windmill. I believe the second assignment, let me just refresh my memory here, it's not a bad idea to, is the humanoid. And I've actually gone over that one already as well. And that one had to deal with positioning of the objects. Oh, okay, so the first one, the windmill, was just getting some objects out there. It's not actually that hard. You're not going to be able to create, let me go back to the windmill one real quick here. <laughs> you're not going to, you're not going to actually create a full windmill. It's not going to work. Um... I mean, it's not going to look like a professional, you know. You're, what you're going to do is put together a cone, put it on a stick, or just put a cone out there. Put some objects out there and orient the objects. You have a windmill and you have some rolling hills, too. So it's to familiarize you, you're going to write a program to display an image of an outdoor scene with a windmill and some hills. Read into that any way you want. You're going to uh, dream up the concept. <sighs> And hopefully you're going to implement it using the GL Translate um, and the look at the perspective, the wire cone, perhaps um, for some of the different mouse and some of the different keyboard. Put together what you can is the way this works. So hardly anyone's going to give me, well, actually people will give me complete running programs. However, um, this is a learning exercise for you to experiment with the concepts. Don't worry about it if it's not perfect. Try to implement what you can to turn it in. The assignments aren't really worth that many points. So I think the, the assignments were worth like five points or something. They're not a significant portion of the grade. The exams are more important. The second assignment is the humanoid that had you put pieces in. You know, you can have one, you know, two. Actually, if you go through the examples, that's how you're going to get this done because I have examples that show you every one of these assignments. Um, you can use a two instead of a one, a, a one piece instead of a two piece leg if you want. Get rid of the neck. I think my example doesn't have a neck in it, actually. Um, it, uses, it doesn't use this shape. It uses, uh, I believe it uses rectangles, I believe, in the one that I put together. But this is the humanoid one that I've also gone over as well. I believe I've hit the third one, but let me just take a quick look. In the third assignment, this particular theme is we're going to, probably going to be ray tracing, but let me see. Let me see real quick. Uh, same as you're going to write a ray tracer. You're not going to be able to write a ray tracer, like a huge ray tracer. I give an input description of the scene. We've actually talked about ray tracing as well. Um, consisting of a sphere and triangles, your program must generate a ray trace image of the scene. So if you weren't here for the ray tracing lecture, go ahead and look it up or go on the internet and look it up. Actually, if you go on the internet and look it up, you're going to be overwhelmed with ray tracing algorithms. Don't worry about the ray tracing algorithm. Don't worry about the ray tracing as a concept. It is extremely difficult. Ray tracers are extremely difficult to implement. And there is no ray tracing feature in OpenGL. Um, it's an add-on ray tracer program that you're going to normally use if you're going to use it. But what you're doing is you're mimicking it with light. So you're going to transmit uh, your program. You should consider the reflected and transmitted components of the light and also compute the shadows, which is kind of the theme for today. We're going to talk about light and shadow. Positions, so the positions of the materials, the properties of the object, the positions of the color of the light are going to be specific to the input scene. And you're going to essentially generate uh, representation rays that are going to be associated with how the light's going to be hitting these objects and where the shadows are going to appear. So you can read through the assignment description. You can compute the pixel color as well, um, the input scene file. Um, and these are kind of some of the things we're going to be talking about today, the ambient light, the background color, uh, reflective index. And uh, the assignment itself is um, has a, you know, a task list for you. Do what you can do. Um, don't be disappointed if you can't implement this 100%. It is not what I would call an easy assignment, which is why for those of you who just walked in a few minutes ago, for the OpenGL class assignments, you only have to do three of the five. So you can pick three of the ones you like the best. Yeah. Maybe, yeah, send an email message out to the class as well. So. 
Number four. Number four. Let's see, take a look at number four real quick as well, because we might as well just go through them all. And an email will be sent out to the class. So, uh, in this particular assignment, actually, I've gone over this one as ready. I think I did this one as well. Uh, write a three D flight simulator program for a plane that's flying over a terrain of environment that you create. And you're like, what? A three D flight? That all these assignments sound extremely outrageous, but you know, you're you're implementing the concept. It's not going to look like a 3D flight simulator. You know, it's not going to be has. It'll probably take you a year to create a 3D uh, flight simulator. Your project has two components. It generates a realistic looking terrain. It doesn't have to be that realistic. It simulates the view of the plane as it's moving. This is to show you the animation of the moving component of it. Uh, so you'll have things, and this is all about. Uh, this is all about translations. Actually, this is all about transformations of the image in the plane and how the positional image is going to move on you. And it has a flight simulator task list here that goes through it. Again, implement as much as you can if you pick to do this one. The first one should be the easiest, the second one should be the next easiest, the third one is, it kind of goes in descending order. Except for the ray tracer I think is probably going to be the most difficult one. You probably could skip that one or implement the concept of the ray tracing without actually doing it completely. Assignment number five, last but not least, is the assignment is intended to familiarize yourself with texture mapping. Texture mapping is actually not that hard. Texture mapping is you're taking a picture, a, you know, an image picture, and you're putting it onto an object. And it's almost like putting a, an image on the desktop of your Windows computer. <laughs> That's what texture mapping is. You know, you're stretching it out over the object, and you're giving it a realistic look. It's kind of like taking a piece of picture of a laminate flooring and creating a floor and putting it on there. <laughs> which is kind of similar in the way laminate flooring is actually installed on flooring, <laughs> but uh, installed the same way in computer graphics as well, by texture mapping. Uh, so the assignment is intended to familiarize yourself with it uh, and creating a splin and a quadratic uh, surface. So imagine you are a game designer and you are to write a program to display the indoor and the outdoor scene of the game of your dreams, anything you want, uh, and then enable the viewer to move about the scene uh, we've actually seen some animation already in terms of uh, how to get movement to, sh to happen. So you use both OpenGL and GLET functions for modeling the scene and the texture mapping of the scene. And you're going to use a mouse and a keyboard input. And in fact, if you look at last week's or the week before, you'll see the mouse and the keyboard uh, functionality that was demonstrated. And you will also need to uh, set up a viewing and a projection transformation. So because you can have to transformate, you have to project and you'll have to trans. It performs some transformation to get the uh, realistic, you know, movement. Um, and if you go through the uh, the example here, it'll tell you how to uh, uh, steps to go through in terms of how you're going to put it together. The assignments themselves are each one of them is about four or five pages long. So this one's three pages long. Um, and I'm not going to read. I'm not going to sit here and take me half the night to read this stuff to you. <laughs> so <laughs> go ahead and read through it. Do what you can. Pick three of the five, essentially. Uh, so, and then don't be disappointed if you can't get it to work 100%. Uh, or if your windmill doesn't look like a windmill, your humanoid doesn't look like a human. So, it's really not going to look like a human anyway. So, okay, so this is in lecture number 18. It's a part one of shading. There's a two part shading. There's part one and part two. Part one is a bunch of concepts, part two is the OpenGL stuff. And uh, what I'm going to do is point you to some examples um, in my Windows partition here. Um, about the shading and about lighting. And so what I want to hit on the lecture portion is definition of a bunch of terms. So you know what the term means. In terms of what you're going to expect for the final exam, no coding. No coding at all. It'll be multiple choice questions on the concepts. As an example, you know, the different types. And uh, as I go through the lecture tonight, I'll give you some examples. And what I'm also going to do is the week before, I believe it's December, first week in December. I believe it's like maybe the 7th for this class, if I'm right. I will be having what's called my final exam review. I'll come up with a Word file and I'll put a bunch of topics in there. And I'll say, know the definition of this, know the definition of that, know what this is, know what that is. It's all theory. It is nothing, uh, in fact, before, you know, while I'm talking about it. <laughs> I have the, uh, the uh, I have the syllabus out here. <laughs> Let's just take a quick look at the syllabus and I'll go back to the lecture in a second. 
soon because uh, usually at this point in the term students are kind of concerned uh, well, you know what's my grade gonna look like <laughs> here it is final exams 25 percent the CSL of essays 25 percent assignments are only 25 percent midterms only 25 percent so the midterm I gave to you is a take-home midterm you should have that so what I'm talking about when I say you only have to do three of the five you're looking at a small percentage of the grade to begin with. You're looking at only 25% of the grade. So, Even students who don't do any of the assignments at all, if you turn in the take-home midterm exam, and you do the CSLO, and you take the final exam, you're going to pass. <laughs> so, uh, Don't worry about Don't let those assignments mess with you because they're, uh, they're not a significant portion. 25% uh, is a significant portion, but... If, if you do everything, you're probably going to end up with an A. That's what I'm saying. So, um, The final exam will be an in-class final exam on Monday the 12th. Um, and going back to that, that's when the week before, I'm going to go over everything you need to know for it. So I'll give you topic by topic. So. Do we have questions back there? Or we're good? Okay, very good. Yes? How much percent? I believe you need a 90%. Yeah, which means if you get 75, you have to do at least two assignments. 75, 75, yeah, 75, 89. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you, in order to get an A, you actually have to turn in three of the five assignments. If you want a B or if you want a C, you get a 75% with turning no assignments in at all. Yeah. <laughs> if you want an A, I would recommend doing three of the five assignments if you can. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Any other questions before we get started? <laughs> yeah, I like the questions because it tells me what I forgot to say. You know, it helps me remember. And I believe I put the CSLO essay out there already and I showed it to you. Did I? What we're looking at are uh, things that are on bhacker.com. And uh, let me just make sure the CSLO essay is out here, actually because it wasn't out for the operating systems course. Oh, I will have the CSLO essay posted before next week. How's that? And it'll be a writing assignment. And I'll make it, uh, I don't have it out. I have the take-home midterm out. I don't have it. See, until I look, I don't know that I don't have it. So <laughs> I have it. It's just not out here. So I'll make the link for it before next week. Actually, I'll probably do it before the end of this week so that you have it available. If you could send me an email message to remind me about that, that way I can do it. Otherwise, when I leave tonight, I'm not going to remember. So, All right, so the CSLO, so I'll try to make that kind of simple for you, too. That'll be like a one- or two-pager kind of thing. And it'll be a written assignment. It won't be programming, either. So, so I'm trying to lighten your load a little bit. So. The midterm is writing. It's answering questions. Yeah, the midterm has been posted, and I went over the midterm uh, several weeks ago. That I do remember. <laughs> so, and that's not a programming assignment. That's a writing assignment. Well, last but not least, shading. <laughs> Let's talk about shading. Uh, learn the shading objects uh, so their images appear three-dimensional. Hmm. Shading actually gives you realism. When everything is all one color and there's no shading, there's no light, things look really uh, fake. I should say. Introduce the types of light material interactions and build a simple reflection model and look at the prong, prong, I can never say that, prong model and uh, it can be used with a real-time graphics hardware. It's one of the most popular generic type graphic models uh, that can be used. Why do we need shading? Uh, suppose we build a model of a sphere using many different polygons and color it with GL color we get something that looks like this. We, we get something like this, but we want this. This one actually has shading. In fact, it looks better on there. It looks better on the projector than it does on my computer. This is all the same color. This is darker here, and it's lighter over here. We've applied shading to it. And it looks more real. There's, believe it or not, and actually every time I kind of like finish my lecture and I kind of look around the room, I go, yeah, it's kind of weird. I see the shading actually on the walls in this room. I can kind of see how shading, you know, because it's all from the light source, which is why I'm talking about lighting today as well. Shading makes things look real. 
so why does the image of a real sphere look like? Well, why does the image of a real sphere look like? Maybe I should say what? Well, light material interacts. So there's interactions that cause each point to have a different color or shade to it. So we need to consider, uh, in order to create realistic shading, we have to actually consider real life in terms of what we're mimicking. Real life, shade comes from light. So we have light sources to consider. And we have different types of lights. We have pinpoint, we have spot, spotlights, we have directional lighting, we have lighting that fills a room, ambient lighting. We've got all sorts of different types of lighting mechanisms. And I'm not going to show you the GL, OpenGL formula or formula function for each one of the functions. Well, I'll show it to you briefly, but you basically, the decision with lighting and shading is picking out what's going to be most effective to give you the most realistic look. We also have material properties. We can have the property of the material for which we're casting the light on be shiny. We can have it be absorbent. It can absorb the light. This is an example of absorbed light. It is taken in and it's become darker. There's no shiny surface. There's no texture associated with this characteristic. It's just a flat color. And the color itself is what's creating the shade. It's the color of the object. And we're not casting. There's no shade. There's no darkness around the object either. So this is, would be considered a shading from a color perspective. The location of the viewer is also something we have to take into consideration. That's not being represented here either. And also the surface orientation. Is it the top, the bottom? Is it the left, right? Is it, are we looking at the surface directly? Or are we looking from a, underneath or above it? So scattering. And here's our, this is going back to this, the vocabulary. <laughs> scattering. So light strikes A. <clears throat> here's A. And, and we have some scattered. So some is scattered and some is absorbed. So we know that the farther we travel and the more bouncing, the lower the intensity. Because as the light, here's the light source, and as it's hitting A, some of it's going to be absorbed into A. And it's going to come out and it's going to scatter, it's going to go out in different directions. And as it goes out, it's going to eventually fade to the point where we can't see the light. So some of the scattering light will strike B. Some of the some scattered will come here, will come here. Some scattered, some might be absorbed into B. Some of the scattered light strikes A as well. So A, B could strike A, A could strike B. This is kind of the concept of ray tracing. We're tracing the ray of the light, <laughs> which is what you're doing in that assignment. And what ray, why ray traces are very, very uh, complicated in terms of what they're accomplishing is how you going to calculate all that. It's a mathematical calculation, essentially, that's going, if I shine a light in, where is it going to bounce off of? How is it going, where is it going to reflect off of? How is it going to scatter? And the scattering is what gives you the realism. So light never hits the back of a surface. So if you turn a, an object around, the bottom should be, you know, should not be as light. But... If you're rotating in a, in, a, in a scene, then the light is hitting it. So when you take an object, you turn it upside down, and it's dark on the bottom. It's not dark on the bottom because you're looking at it in the light. <laughs> it's the object that could, uh, turned around, but the light source never got changed. And I showed you an example of that, actually, last week, where we had light hitting the front of a, I think it was like a donut-shaped object. And I turned the donut upside down, it turned black. And that was actually because of, it was... Not really a lighting thing, but it was because it was uh, it hidden. It was a hidden surface removal, as I think what was the situation going on there. But we have a rendering equation that occurs: the infinite scattering and the absorption of the light that can be described by a rendering equation. So a rendering equation cannot be solved in general. Hmm. So it's a tough one. <laughs> so ray tracing is a special case of perfectly reflecting surfaces. So if we were to trace it, and we were to get it, and it would be perfect, but when is it ever going to be perfect? Because we have light sources that could also interfere with our light source. And we have, you know, different properties of different objects that could, uh, you know, reflect light or not reflect light, depending upon how we're essentially going to have it scattered. Rendering equation is global and includes shadows, multiple scatterings from object to object. 
So one object can scatter onto another object as well. Important thing to get out of this lecture, as I mentioned before, is the vocabulary, <laughs> is the terminology that's being used. So, you know, as a human, we all are familiar with these, but, you know, until you've actually sat down looking about it, most people know what shadows are. You know, that's a shadow. The light from the viewer and the light source, the light's coming from here, casts the, the ray, if you trace the rays, it actually sends it to this object. The back of the object's got the shadow on it. That's how we're casting it. We have a shadow here as well. We have a shadow here as well. We have a translucent surface. Well, that's one that you can see through. So we have some objects that are going to absorb. Some objects are going to have the light pass through it. And the light passing through it is going to determine the, perhaps the shape of the object, or excuse me, perhaps the shape of the shadow, or perhaps another property that's associated with the, the object and the illumination. We have multiple reflections that occur. So the light hit this guy, and then it hit this guy, and then it hit this guy. Whoops. I accidentally clicked the mouse. So we have multiple reflections, translucent surfaces, and shadows as an example of the global effects that might occur. It's global because this one light source is hitting all of the objects. So we're, we're looking at in terms of the global effect. The local versus the global rendering. So correct shading requires a global calculation involving all of the objects in the light source, everything in the scene. It's incompatible with pipeline model uh, which shades each polygon independently, which is which was really considered local rendering. So local rendering is each one of the different objects, and so they're rendered differently than the entire scene is rendered. The pipeline takes the individual objects, creates them, puts them in orientation, and then the final step actually just presents them, gives them to the user. In computer graphics, especially real-time graphics, we're happy if things just look right. We're happy if we can just mimic it. Um, so exists many different types of techniques for approximating global effects, and this is where a lot of the ray tracing algorithms and a lot of the uh, modern day approaches to improvement are, and a lot of the areas of research, are, uh, some of them are actually in lighting, actually, because it's not a perfect concept. So we have light and material interaction. When the light hits the material, we have an interaction that's going to occur. The light that strikes an object is particularly absorbed or par excuse me, partially absorbed or partially scattered or reflected. So scattering means that the light is reflected, it's bouncing, it's projecting itself on multiple different objects, it's scattering. Um, the amount of reflection reflected determines the color and the brightness of the object. So the color can uh, definitely have a, and this is where shading actually comes into play, the color can be darker or lighter depending upon the, you know, the effect of the light. So the surface appears red under white light uh, because the red component of the light is reflected and the rest is, absor is absorbed. And uh, we actually haven't even considered the color of the light. We're thinking white light in most of these examples, but we can change the color of the light as well. Uh, the reflected light is scattered in a manner that uh, depends on the smoothness and the orientation of the surface. So let's take a look at some light sources. General light sources are difficult to work with because we must integrate light coming from all the points on the surface. So the light source is, uh, here's our, this is our light bulb. And we have point one and point two on the surface. And uh, we're integrating them and we're projecting them out this way. And so it kind of is, is, it is sort of a difficult concept in terms of prediction. And how is the light supposed to affect the object? So unless people walk around with a flashlight and walk into a room and start shining it all over the place, which, you know, actually I I've, 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 uh, was watching a, it was a PBS documentary on uh, realism and graphics, and uh, one guy actually did that. He was like, walks around with different like, types of lights, you know, to experiment with what's going to look more realistic and what does it actually look like. Because it's kind of interesting when you see a scene that's like maybe in a computer game or some sort of an animation, and you look at that and go, something's really wrong, but I don't know what. It's because something in the scene, and the computer graphics, doesn't match what normally happens in real life. You know, like the light is coming from the wrong end of the building or something, or the, like the door's upside down, or there's something odd about it, but the mind doesn't actually pick it up. The light and the shading is usually what is the problem. 
It's usually because, like, the shadow's on the wrong side of the object. But your mind doesn't, you don't see it because you see the shadow and you see the light. It doesn't hit you until, you know, because it's wrong. And something seems odd, but you don't know what it is. Okay, simple light sources. Here's some examples. Point spot light and ambient light. I actually gave this to you already in my little introduction. But the point source. So the model with a position and a color. And we have a distance source where it equals the infinite distance away or parallel. So think of it like a flashlight. It's a point source for which light is illuminating from, sort of like a, sp a flashlight. The spotlight resists light from ideal point source, so it restricts light from the ideal point source. And the spotlight is a little bit bigger. It's, uh, it projects away from the point instead of it being on the point. So I guess you can think more of a point source as one of those laser pointers. You know, you ever seen those things? You can hold them up on the, uh, but the laser pointer is pretty small. They actually have some bigger laser pointers that cast up bigger, bigger points on a, on a surface. So spotlight is a little bit bigger than that as well. Ambient light. So the same amount of light everywhere in the scene. I can model a contribution uh, of many different sources and reflecting surface. So what do we have in this room? <sighs> Trick question. I gave it to you just a few minutes ago, actually. And this is an ambient lit room. Because we have panels of fluorescent bulbs on the ceiling, and the entire room is supposed to be illuminated at the same light, and we don't have we don't have a spotlight in this room. You go to a, a jazz bar or whatever. You go you go to a you know performers karaoke bar. There's a spotlight, so it's just like you know, the terminology is actually pretty easy because it's, it mimics what we see in lighting in the real world. But the stage is lit up. And the rest of the room is not lit up. That's a spot, actually. Flashlights, pointer devices, cars, those are points. In fact, a lot of cars you can actually see. If I were implementing a car and it was nighttime and I wanted to run through my scene, I'd put two points for two headlights coming out of the car. A lamp, it's going to be a point. It's going to be a surface from a light bulb. Perhaps maybe multiple points. And multiple points in the lamp. So. But this is ambient lighting. <laughs> uh, we have surface types. So the way, depending upon the surface type, the light's going to hit a little differently. And you can do this in the real world. Just take a shiny object, put it in a light. It shines for a reason because the light is reflecting off of it. It's not absorbing anything. And then we have objects that absorb everything that are flat, black surface objects. You put light, you shine a light on a black wall, nothing happens. That's why they put black walls in nightclubs. <laughs> Because it gives it a slightly different look. So, uh, the smoother a surface, the more reflective the light is concentrated in the direction. A perfect mirror would re reflect uh, would re well, would reflect the light. So, the smoother the surface, the more reflective the surface. The more perfect it is in terms of how it's going to project the light off of the surface. So, how it's going to scatter it. Um, so we can actually create a mirror. That's a, kind of an interesting concept. We can create a mirror in computer graphics. Just make it extremely shiny. Make it uh, mirror colored. And make it shiny. Get a mirror. And then you can it really mess up the user. You can project an image in the mirror that's identical to the other image instead of reversing it. <laughs> and then you look at that and go, well, what's wrong with that? Well, the mirror's not really, the image isn't reversed. <laughs> no, that looks fake. But most, of, most people won't pick that up. So a very rough surface scatters light in all different directions. It's not quite as reflective. So this is why when we take the mirror and we take the sun, we can actually burn something with it because it, it's mimicking a true property of life or true property of uh, physics, basically. Uh, the smooth surface is going to project it a lot more. Rough surface is going to scatter it. Extremely uh, non, well, extremely uh, dull surfaces are not going to reflect it at all. They're just going to absorb it. So here, here we have our prong model. A simple model that can be computed rapidly. This is the one that's a, this one is supported in OpenGL. Has three components to it. We have diffuse, specular, and ambient. These are essentially our different types of uh, light that we're going to apply. We have four different vectors. We have to the source, to the viewer. We have the normal, and then we have the perfect reflector. And so we have these 
components in OpenGL, what does this mean to you? These are different properties you have to set, different parameters when we create the function, when we run the function call to create this kind of component. We have to consider all of the different options that are associated with it. So here's a, an example of the ideal reflector. So normal is determined by the local orientation. So we have our normal orientation within our, our world, our XYZ coordinate sphere that we're, excuse me, image world plane, as plane is the word I was looking for, that we're projecting. So we, we determine the normal by the locality orientation. The angle of uh, the incident is the, equals the angle of the reflection, which is how the reflection is going to occur given the orientation. And then we have the three vectors that must be coplanar um, in order to essentially get our uh, components that are necessary for the reflection. Lamberton surface. So perfectly diffused reflector. So we saw before we have a surface type orientation. The light scattered equally in all different directions on a Lamberton. Uh, the amount of light reflected is proportional to the vertical component of the incoming light. And there's also three components associated with it. There's the RBG, which is the color that's associated. That can show how much of each color component is reflected, which is kind of interesting. So if we have color component, it's going to give us our shading, or it's going to give us our contrast, it's going to give us our effect. And so we can set that as a component in terms of the, the three coordinates of the light that's being projected off of it. Um, so. Or we have a specular surface. So this particular one uh, is going to basically scatter in all directions on it, kind of in an equal way. It's not going to uh, be particular in one direction or another. This guy is going to scatter off in a particular direction. This one here, a specular surface, most of the surfaces are nearly ideal diffusers, nor they're not perfect speculars either. They're ideal reflectors. So smooth surfaces that are going to show specular highlights through the incoming light being reflected in all directions or concentrated close to the direction of the perfect reflector. So what we normally see in this particular case is lightness. So this particular effect is, is showing how at the particular specular highlight, at the particular direct, at, at, right on the point, is going to be the lightest and it's going to be, as we project out this way, we're going to get sort of a, not really equal, but you know, in fact, if you stare at this long enough, you can kind of see a circle here. You can kind of, kind of see it, and then it kind of scatters out in this direction uh, in terms of the objects. Uh, it would be a specular surface condition. So in terms of modeling it, the prong proposed uh, using a term that dropped off as the angle between the viewer and the ideal reflective increases. So what we end up having is the initial source coming to a point, and we end up having it, uh, the shininess and its intensity kind of. And this is why I said here, if you kind of stare at this long enough, you sort of see a white circle here. Or you should. In fact, really poor graphic screens will show more of a, it'll be more of an object looking kind of thing, and then it kind of diffuses out. And it's not, it's not a, it's not a round, it's not, it's not scattered equally. It's scattered in this direction in this particular example. And it kind of fades out. You can't really tell exactly, you can't really tell exactly where the light stops, uh, which gives it realism. So we have the reflector intensity, the absorption coefficient, the shininess coefficient, and then the incoming intensity uh, that are factors that are put in here. And this is, you don't need to know the calculations for any of this stuff. You don't need to know any of the, in fact, another side comment for the final exam. I'm not going to ask you anything about the functions either. <laughs> You don't have to know anything about OpenGL either on the final exam. It's going to be all concepts. You know, definitely we'll give you a list of those concepts. But it's not what I would call a technical OpenGL programming. You know. Shininess coefficient, you know, the values are essentially being between two, two values that are preset to correspond to the metals that are associated with it. And then we have values that look at, you know, like plastic. So depending upon the... Uh, the values that we're adding towards the particular concept, and going back to that comment I meant about the mirror, we can make something look like a mirror. We can make something look like a piece of metal, uh, which all contain um, 
concepts that are associated with color and shading. So. That was number 18. Throw number 18 away so I keep track of what I'm doing. Number 19, I'm going to show you what's in it, and then I'm going to let you experiment with it when you start using it. There's some concepts in here, but there's also a lot of OpenGL formulas. So it's a continuation of the shading concept, introducing a modified prong model, considering a computations of the required vectors. I'm not going to have you consider those computations. So you don't have to worry about that. So, In terms of ambient light, the ambient light is the result of multiple different interactions between a large light source and uh, objects in the environment. So in terms of the ambient, actually you can see that in this room there's ambient light that's cast in shadows. Uh, the amount and the color depend on both the color of the lights and the material properties um, of the objects. And we had uh, added co uh, K with an A reflection coefficient and intensity of light, the diffuse uh, specular terms that are associated with it. We have distance terms. Uh, so the light from a point source that reaches the surface is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. So there's calculations that actually, that, you know, science people have actually put together to give you how far that that light is actually supposed to project so we can add a factor of the form to it for you know to change the light for a diffuser for, for, for specular kind of conditions we can there's a you know, modify the formula essentially to tell you well then if the surface is like this it should go farther or it should go shorter so the constants and the linear terms soften the effect of the point source in terms of the light sourcing in the prong model, uh, we added the results of each one of the light sources were added in terms of, and this is supported in OpenGL. Uh, each light source has a separate diffuse specular ambient term uh, to allow the maximum flexibility, even when its form does not have a physical justification to it, which is kind of interesting. You can add things that don't have a, like a physical characteristic to an object that shouldn't have one. Separate out the red, green, and the blue components, and you highlight the nine coefficients for each one of the light sources. So in your function, you're going to basically specify out nine different areas of coefficients that are going to be parameters that you're going to set to achieve the particular effect that you're looking for. So this is where it becomes a, you know, a bit more like look it up and practice it and figure out what these nine coefficients are going to do in terms of the effect and follow examples. So. Material properties. Material properties uh, match the light source properties. We have nine absorbent coefficients, shininess coefficients as well. Um, so we, we set, these are again parameters that you're sending to the function to achieve the particular um, effect. So adding up all the components, and that's what kind of, you know, going back here actually for a side comment. There's ways you can mess these up so you don't get the effect. <laughs> that's why I say when you start looking at examples, then you start going, oh, We'll set this one lower than that one, and set this over here, and then you can switch the light from the left to the right of the object, or you can switch the, the effect to make it more reflective, make it more uh, diffused. So for each one of the light sources and each color component on the model can be written uh, without the distance terms as, and here's just a you know, representation of the model. For each color component, we added a contribution for all of the different sources that might be associated with it. In terms of the modified prong model, specular term in the prong model, it's problematic because it requires a calculation of the new reflective vector and the new vector for each one of the vertices, uh, vertexes. So uh, Blim, another guy, suggested an approximation using a halfway vector for more, more efficiency. This is the part you don't really need to know, but there's different variations of the prong model that exist to perform essentially uh, to get rid of side effects and things that would happen in the original one. So we have a normalization vector that's halfway between 1 and V to add some more normalization to it. So. And here's some examples. I'm going to kind of skip through. You don't really need to know this this particular, you don't really even know, you, need, you don't even actually need to know how it's calculated either. So here's some examples. The only differences in these teapots are the parameters that are used. And so you can kind of see how the teapots, in fact, you can, yeah, you can probably see them. This is shiny, not so shiny. So, the ones over here have the most shininess, have, the, have a larger, larger shine spot on it. And these guys, hardly any. So this is 
It's a black object, though. You kind of see this one. So some of the effects, depending upon how you set them, and the rows are supposed to be equal. Like this one here would look like it would go here, but because of the color of the object, the shininess is not giving us the same effect as it did on the lighter ones. In fact, even this one, this particular object here, this we've got more on the lighter colored object. We've got more of a reflect. We've got more of a light effect to it. So, and the rows are giving us the different colors with the different effects. So you can kind of sort of maybe get the impression that color and lighting <laughs> and shading have a lot to do with each other in terms of achieving the effect. So. You may go through the rest of this. You're not responsible for it. Uh, but you may go through the rest of that stuff that I said I was going to skip through. That was number 19. And uh, lecture number 20. Shading. So we just looked at the light. So actually, we've been talking about shading all over the place. But here's how it's applied towards OpenGL. So look at the OpenGL shading functions. Discuss polygon, polygonal shading. And the primary focus of this lecture is to look at the flat, the smooth, and the gorad. Can you pronounce this right? So steps in the OpenGL shading. So we just say we're going to apply this shading concept to our scene. We're going to number one, we're going to enable the shading and select a model. So we have a couple different models to pick one. We're going to specify the normals, we're going to specify the material properties, and then we're going to specify the lights. Because if we're going to put shade in there, we have to have light. Otherwise, the shading is going to look weird. But um, we can actually have the shading without the light source. But, you know. Let's talk about normals for a second. In OpenGL, the normal vector is part of the state, as you remember before. So we can set by GL normal. It sets the orientation of the scene. We have to set the orientation of the scene in order to put a light source in there. Because it's like, you know, is it coming from the sun? Is it coming from uh, the floor? Uh, is it a lamp? So the orientation is actually kind of an important thing, setting the normal. Usually we want to set the normal to have a unit length, so uh, cosine cal calculations are correct. So the calculations essentially of the light source are correct. The length can be affected by the transformations. The transformations are when the objects are moving. And note that the scale does not prevent length, uh, excuse me, not, does not preserved, not, does not preserve, preserved length. Well, that's really bad English. And GL enable, enable the organ, normalization allows for auto normalization uh, at a performance penalty. Actually, this you're not going to notice in a video game or you're going to notice it. If the orientation is automatically normalized, it's going to cut down, which means the algorithm is going to take a long time for the rendering. Which means your scene's not going to paint as fast as it should. But in a normal, you know, a scene coming up from nowhere, you know, not used in the game or an interactive component, it's probably not going to be too bad. Here's a normal for a triangle. So we, we have the plane and then we have the object that's sitting in the plane and we have the positions that are oriented with each one of the points of the object. So note that the right hand rule uh, determines the outward face. Because depending upon how we're going to normal the object, we're going to end up with a face. And the normal is the face, the surface face. So the face is going to be facing us, going away from us, on the bottom, on the top. Uh, so the normalization is important for it. So in terms of enabling the shading, the shading calculations are enabled by a GL. Enable lighting. Uh, so once lighting is enabled, GL color is ignored because the lighting is going to overwrite the color. So you must enable each light source individually. You can have multiple light sources. You don't have to have just one. And you choose the lighting model parameters that you'd like to use for it. And uh, here's a couple of examples. The GL light model local viewer. Do not use a simplified distance viewer assumption in calculations of a two-sided shades both sides of the polygon independently instead of shading it together. So. And nobody, and this is like, you know, this is like, you know, any, anything that is particular to programming language syntax in general, nobody memorizes all the parameters or how you use it. <laughs> so that's where those books come in handy, those reference books, um, or the red book. So defining a point source as an example for each one of the light sources, you can set an RGB, RGBA for the diffuse, specular, and the ambient component, and for the positions. So here's an example of uh, what we're looking at. In terms of the diffuse, the ambient, the specular, and we're setting the RGBA, so the red, green, the blue, and the uh, 
alternative, uh, oh, excuse me, here we have the, uh, just the sample uh, source code. This, this is essentially not going to, I'm not going to do much for you looking at this slide. So I'm going to show you some examples when I get done with this lecture to point you to some, uh, one of the files or a couple of the files that are at the behacker.com website. I'm just going to show you some examples of it. So the distance and the direction, the source colors are specified by the RGBA. So the position is given in a homogeneous kind of coordinate system, or W is equal to 1.0. We're specifying a finite location, zero. The other st side of the scale, we're specifying a parallel source uh, with a given vector. So we calculate out the, the position in terms of the, the direction. Spotlights, we use the GL light V to set it. So the direction of the spotlight, the cutoff point, the attenuation, how far should the light go in terms of the spotlight. And then as we notice the effect, the light's going to essentially start out sort of pinpoint and then eventually diffuse out at the, at the other end so in terms of its intensity scale. The global ambient light, and it depends on the color of the light surface. So red light in a room, white room, will cause a red ambient term that, dis that disappears when the light is turned off. So we'll have a you know a special shading that happens with the room, and then uh, when you turn the light off or the light goes away or before the light even comes on, the particular objects won't be shaded the same way. So OpenGL also allows for global ambient term that is often helpful for testing. So here's the concept in terms of uh, the light model. So another OpenGL function to run for that. And then we have moving light sources. And I'm going to show you a moving light source example as well. So this light, light sources are uh, geometric objects whose positions and directions are affected by the model view matrix. So as the object moves, the light's going to hit it at a different angle. Uh, so the light is actually moving or the object is moving throughout the scene. Depending upon where we place the position or direction, setting up the function, we can move the light source with the objects. So as the object moves, the light source moves. It would be like a spotlight, kind of, you know, going back to the karaoke example or the, you know, if the guy's moving on the stage, maybe the light should move with him. <laughs> so uh, fix the objects and move the light source. So it would be like a sunset or sunrise illuminating a, a beach or something. And uh, fix the light sources and move the objects. So the light, you know, you're holding something under a light and you're moving the object under the light. So the object itself is being illuminated differently depending upon its position. Or we can move the light source and the objects independently. That's not going to give us very much realism. <laughs> but we can do it if we want to. And I'm sure there's some particular situations where that might be, uh, might be desirable. So in terms of the material properties, here are the functions that are associated with that. The material properties are also part of the OpenGL state and match the terms of the model prong model. And uh, by default, OpenGL uses a prong model. Um, that's the main model for lighting. Um, you can add on other models, and there's other different types of utilities, third-party, nine OpenGL utilities that you can put on there to kind of play around with the concept. In fact, when you work with some of the packages that work with uh, on top of the API, then built on top of OpenGL, like a WRML as an example, they come up with their own different lighting models that are a lot simplified, actually, with a lot less work. Um, so it's an API written on top of an API, essentially. We have the concept of front and back surfaces or faces. So the default is a shade only front face, which works correctly for convex objects. If we set two sides shading, OpenGL will shade both sides of the surface. And then uh, each side will have its own properties, which are basically set for GL front, back, front and back, in terms of the material properties. Your back faces are not visible. And here we have back faces that are visible, in terms of the back face there, or the back face uh, that would be underneath here is visible. So here we have no back faces. We have emissive, light, emissive terms, so we can simulate the light sources of the OpenGL by giving the material an emissive component. How strong is the light? Uh, this component is unaffected by any of the sources of the transformations, so emissive is going to essentially be giving it a, a, another term that we can add, add to the function. We can also give it uh, transparency, uh, so material properties, and this is also a material property as well. 
um, in terms of the simulating the light source. In terms of the transparency of the properties from material properties that are specified by the RGBA values, the A value, of the R red, green, blue A value is going to be used to make the surface translucent. So is it see-through? Is it solid? That's the third element, or excuse me, fourth element of the color is how translucent it is. It the default uh, is that all surfaces are opaque regardless of the A. Later we'll enable the blending. Use this feature. So you leave the A alone, and you're going to get it an opaque. So. Efficiency. Uh, because material properties are part of the state, we change the materials for many of the different surfaces. We can affect the performance if we're changing everything about the, uh, the particular properties of the objects. That could be a lot of rendering that happens. Uh, so we can make the code cleaner by defining material structure and setting all the materials during the initialization. So we have a, here's a type define, uh, and this is a C code to basically take a, create a structure, and the structure is going to be the material structure, and it's going to have in here uh, settings for ambient, diffuse, specular, shininess, and then we can use this structure again and again. So we can set the material by a pointer as well. Polygonal shading. So this would be shading calculations that are done for each one of the vertex the colors. Uh, the vertex colors become the vertex shades. By default, the vertex shades are interpopulated across the polygons. Uh, so we can use the shade model, GL flat as an example, and the colors at the first vertex will determine the shade of the whole polygon. Here's our example here. Polygons are a single normal. They have single normals to them. The shades uh, at the vertexes are computed by the, the prong model. That can almost be the same. Uh, identical from the distance viewer by default, or if they are, if there's no specular component to it. So we consider the model of a sphere as an example. And if we want different normals at each one of the vertexes, even though this concept is not quite correct mathematically, um, doesn't really. Um, it's, this is essentially demonstrating the point of the surface normals and how they're shaded in terms of uh, the concept. Here's a smooth, and this is our polygonal normals, because all these are polygons connected together, and we're applying shading to each one of the polygons. So we're not getting any smooth. We're getting a rigid transition between the different shadings of the polygons. We could make this uh, appear a little bit uh, less rigid, uh, if we wanted to, we'd just add more polygons. The uh, higher level of polygons we're putting on here, the more detail that we're going to be able to see. We could create a smooth, a smoother looking, not as rigid. Or we can use a smooth shading technique where we have smoothness in terms of uh, how, how the, the blending of the colors is working. So we set a new normal at each one of the vertexes. And then, uh, easy for the sphere model, now smooth shading works. So we have this silhouette edge goes on. Mesh shading, uh, just, like a, just a previous example, not is not uh, general because we uh, knew the normals at each one of the vertexes analytically, which is we're, we're, we're still taking and considering the vertexes of the surface normals in this particular example, just like the last one. Uh, here for the polygon model, the Gurund proposed, this is the, the guy who proposed it, which is why all these names are kind of odd, Prong and Gurund, I'm saying that at night, Gurund, uh, used an average of the normals around a mesh vertex, which creates a different type of an effect to it. So the Gurund and the Prong shading, to give you an example of how these differ, Gurund shading, you find the average normal at each one of the vertexes, or the vertex normals. You apply a modified prong model each one of the vertexes, and you interpopulate the vertex shades across each one of the polygons, and you get more smoothness in terms of the transitions. The prong shading, you find the vertex normals, you interpopulate the vertex normals across the edges, and you interpopulate the edge normals across the polygons, and you apply a modified prong model at each one of the fragments. So it's two separate approaches, giving you two separate um, two separate implementations. If in terms of the comparison, if the polygon mesh approximates surfaces with high curvatures, the prong shading may look more realistic or more smooth, while ROM shading may show edges. Prong shading requires much more work than the ROM because there's more calculations going on. 
um, until recently not available in real-time systems because uh, you can't get the realism to actually generate fast enough. can be done using fragment shaders. This chapter 9 is of the red book, the link I gave you a few weeks back. So you both need uh, data structures to uh, represent the meshes so you can obtain the vertex normals and actually perform the calculation. So it means absolutely nothing to look at PowerPoints. <laughs> so <laughs> I shouldn't say that. It probably gives you the background information. So what I've done is uh, this example file, this is the one that comes from bhacker.com, uh, and it's called uh, example files. And in here, I'm going to have a moving light, a shade, and then I've got these three smooth color, uh, there's a color match, and then there's a moving light example. And these, all of these have come from this zip file that's available on bhacker.com. So in terms of the moving light, and you'll have to create your own dev project for it, but uh, you can just load the C++ file into it. I want to show you how these examples uh, actually work. I'll make this as big as possible so you can see it. So I can probably make this window bigger too. Let's see. Let's make the window a little bit bigger. Hmm. Okay, okay. A lot of good that did. How come the window's not going bigger? Hmm. All right. Well, this is this will work. Yeah, I know. This will work too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there we go. This one is called Moving Light Dot C. Sets up a light that moves independent of the objects in the scene. So we have the left mouse button and the right mouse button. And let's see if it makes. I don't know if it's going to work with this mouse or not. Uh, the left mouse button changes the incidence of the angles. The middle button, I don't have a middle button. Actually, I do have a middle button. It changes the twist angle based on a horizontal mouse movement. And then we have the right button. It's going to zoom in and out based on the vertex movements. And we have a toggle the light animation uh, with A and M to do an infinite error. And the escape key is going to exit the program. What you're going to see in here is uh, nothing more than a couple of function calls, actually more than one, but we have a, a, some of them that are going to set the local light for the scene. It's not using a global, it's using a local. And uh, the source code, I'm not going to go through it, but if, if you kind of, I'm just going to vaguely just kind of come through it a little bit. We're going to see in our mouse events, which we learned last week or the week before, we're looking at uh, the basic components that are normally in here, setting color, uh, clearing the color, setting color, setting the keyboard events. The source is not really that complicated uh, in terms of the motion. Um, it's it's kind of straightforward. I kind of wanted to show you. Here's, here's the lighting stuff. So our red ambient, our red diffuse, our blue ambient, our blue diffuse. Here are the settings. These are the floats and float values, defining them a few material properties. The local light itself, the light position. These are what the function calls are going to look like in terms of how you're going to set the information for the scene, uh, the ambient, the diffuse. And you notice that the names of these particular arguments are similar, but you're going to find some variations between the different OpenGL versions. So the uh, depending upon how the function names and the parameters have stopped, I mean, have, uh, have changed in terms of uh, the set defaults, um, you may or may not uh, recognize, and you'll have to look them up, essentially. Oops, I boarded it. How did I do that? Let me see. Let me compile this sucker again. Done. Very good. So now I'm going to run this guy. And I'm going to see in the window here. The right is moving us this way. So I have a light. These objects are moving independent. Let's see. We've got... Let's just take a look at this blue object for a second. I've got a rotation that's happening. Got my mouse button. My mouse is not exactly okay. I can rotate this way. But see, we have the light here. Actually, this is what I want to achieve. I don't know if you can see this, but the light is actually moving in a circle around. You can kind of see how the light source itself is causing the effect on the object. Um, let's see if I can move it in a little bit. 
Going around this way. There we go. I guess I say about blue. The blue guy is kind of easy to see. This is the light source. As it's coming through the scene, it is uh, providing a predetermined calculation that's set from the function. This is all the automation of the function. It's all done for you in OpenGL. You can kind of see how this guy here is rotating as well. I see this is making it transforming it. There we go. Let's go this way a little bit. Ah, there we go. I'll rotate this way. Ah, here we go. This is it's kind of a more... Ah, there we go. Now we can see the light actually. Stuff getting dark. We can see the light with the source going through. Basically showing you how to move the light. This is why it's called moving light. So the light source is moving throughout the scene. You can sort of see how it has an effect on all three of these objects in terms of the illumination. And that one is available for you, and it compiles just fine in uh, dev. It's available for you in that file that I showed you. Now here's one that is kind of interesting. This one's called material.c. And uh, material, this is, the first one was moving light.c. Material.c is going to have a shading effect to it. And the shading effect uh, is going to be setting a matte, an ambient, color, diffuse. And here we have, again, you know, just kind of a quick, quick kind of look at these are the function calls that are, and there's a million of them. There's like 20, 25 or 30 of them just dealing with shading um, that we're going to apply towards the objects in the scene. And we're going to set, uh, let me just refresh my memory on this example here. I don't believe this one has any activity. Uh, it has the escape key to exit out, but there's no user input for this one. Uh, so I'm going to compile this one. I'll show you what material looks like. There we go. It's kind of like the slide that um, had the different shading and the different light sources applied. And this might be a good one to kind of uh, to look at in terms of how do you, how do you get the certain properties? And you can see that each one of these, each one of the columns, is setting a different property for each one of the objects and using different colors. So we can say, see that diffuse the flat surface versus the shiny one, shiny surfaces versus uh, you know, different colors that are associated with it. So it kind of gives you an idea of how the shading, you know, this shading here would be different than this type of shading and this, this light source hitting it. It's going to look a little different. So. That one might give you some examples of, uh, because it's running through all of the different, uh, all of the different options you might have. Our ambient, our diffuse, our specular, our shiny, setting the emission, emiss emission out. And then we have three other ones, Move Light, Smooth, and Color Matte. And I, I didn't really set projects up for each one of them. Rather, I'm just going to load them in here. So the first one's going to be Move Light. And Move Light, let me just refresh my memory on this one. It's going to have uh, Smooth Lighting Light. Uh, this one is just going to flash a light. That's what this is going to be. Uh, see, there's no user activity to it either. So let me just run it. You'll see what this one does. And the purpose of showing you these is, is trying to give you an idea of what these examples are doing so it might help you. Um, yeah, this is the different one. This is, all right, so if you click uh, here, what I'm doing is I'm moving the object without moving the light. So if, when we, when we first started it out, the, uh, the light is hitting the surface normal, the front of the object. As we rotate the object, we're seeing the back of the object that's not illuminated. So we're not changing, uh, we're not rotating, we're not changing the um, the light effect. So this is what I would call would be extremely unrealistic. <laughs> However, if we were to rotate the scene around, and I don't think we can do it the other way, we would, if we walked behind the object, it would be realistic. But in this particular case, we're moving the object in orientation. The orientation of the light source is right here, actually. So this little box here, showing you that the light's hitting the, 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 this is the light source. And as we move the light source, we see light sources here. When we put the light source behind, and we see the light's coming through this way, and then the rest of it's dark. So, so this one's interesting because of the moving light source. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Since the uh, let me do a search here. GL. Look at. Uh, I don't think I spelled that right. Uh, let me just go through manually here. Did you see it? You must have seen it. What did you want me to do? Change some values? I ain't going to mess it up. Let's see what happens. I'm going to change a lot of values here. I'm probably going to mess this up. There's probably not going to do anything. Let's see. Let's see. Actually, it's a good experiment. Let me see. The orientation is going to be wrong. <laughs> it's gone. It probably. Oh, no, here it is. It's down here. Did you see? Wait, hold on a second. Uh, Oops. See this down here? <laughs> the shape of it's down here. If you're not seeing, if your image is coming up blank or you're seeing the wrong part, change the look at. Here, let me, let me, actually, actually, I, I can fix that right here, I bet. Just with right here. Let's see. Is that the problem that you were having that you were talking about earlier? Yeah. Ah, that didn't do it either. All right, so let me change the other. Let me change. Let me change. What did I put in here? I put a one here. Let's change that. Ah, now it's here. So I'm moving it this way. Let's see if I can move it out. No, let's see. Hold on one second. Uh. Did I put this three in? No, but I better put this in here. So I'm gonna set the X. So I'm gonna set the R. No, I think that's. I think I put, might have put this three in here. Let's see. Actually, I'll just look at the other example and pull the. I'll pull it out and we'll see. Ah, there it is. Yeah. So let's change this one to. To one. And it'll probably go down the screen. It'll probably move down the. Uh... There it is. It moved down. So it's giving you the orientation. Uh, how exactly to set the coordinate system? <laughs> That's the tricky part. So if I put this on four. In fact, this is probably the one that was causing, causing it to go over here. If I put it on four, it's gonna it's gonna go down even further. Oh yeah, it's way off the screen now. So let's stick that on zero. Now it's in the middle again. Yeah. The interesting thing, actually, this is a good example. I'll put it back on one. The orientation of the light source to the object, even though the object has moved in the plane, should work identically. Yeah, there it goes. It's the same effect. It was just moving the orientation of the object. It made it go down further. Unfortunately, uh, to get it positioned, and especially uh, to, 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 to set this initially, might be the challenge. Okay, okay. Nice experiment. Oh, wait a minute. So let's look at the, I have two more, smooth and a color mat. Should have closed that because I was going to, and this is what I'm doing actually. I'm, I'm just removing, I'm using one generic project and I'm adding, I'm going to put smooth in here. Because you can't, if you double click on the files and you just bring them up, they're not going to compile. You need to have it actually put into an OpenGL project. And the way you do that project is just get a new project. You select multimedia and you go open. You go glut. And then you're going to create the new project. And then you just add the file to it. Um, Alright, so this one does not have any uh, keyboard effect either. It's going to say, say, this is actually kind of a small example when I think about it. This one might be a good one to start with. It's called Smooth. It's setting a smooth surface. So, 
Here, I'll show you what it's doing. It's just setting a smooth transition of the coloring. So it's adding all of these different colors to the object, and it's um, using a. It is. Uh, initial display mode to single RGB window size position size window. Oh, here we go. Reshape. Two D object. Setting, setting, yeah, yeah, to a triangle, calling triangle, and flush. And here's our triangle colors. So it's, a, it's the color, the vertex, the colors, the vertex colors. And setting all the different colors of the vertex. Mm -hmm. Setting out GL triangles. Using a GL shade model to GL smooth. This is, this right here is the line of code that the example was written for to kind of demonstrate. I'll move this in a little bit. This is the only significant part of the <laughs> is to show you how you can get the color model to do the smoothness of the beginning of the color so that when you're when you're running it you don't have the you don't have this color stopping on a line. It's smoothing a transition between the different color points that we're putting in here in, in terms of the triangle. I think I put that in there because you can apply that with black shading as well to get the same kind of an effect on a different type of surface. So. And now if I uh, add this last one, oh, did I do the last one? No, color mat was the last one. So color map is uh, going to initialize some light source and some lighting model. And look at it. Uh, buffered color. Uh, let's take a look and see what it's doing. Actually, let me just take a look, quick peek here. It does have a mouse event uh, with the mouse button, the left button, the right button, the middle button, and the keyboard. It's just the exit, so let's take a look here. Yeah, when you right, uh, right mouse click, it's going to change the color. When you left mouse click, it's also changing the color. And the middle is changing the light. So this example is essentially put in here to help you kind of figure out what kind of an effect given. Here we go, that's, that's interesting. The light source changing with the color of the, well, there's a blue. That's cool. So as the more light I'm adding, the blue is getting lighter and lighter and lighter. So it's going to rotate through all the preset light conditions. It's interesting how the color actually changes, too. It goes from a dark blue to like a turquoise color. These are black going into green. And if you go through here, you'll kind of see how the mouse clicks. Oops, let's go through here. Here we got the case here where we're setting the diffuse material, the different variations of it, um, with a different color. Basically showing in the diffuse material and how, the, how the effect of the, oops, the middle, so the left, right. Okay. I would uh, recommend downloading the example, going through it and um, making a few changes to it and then using it kind of as a means. And these are not all of the examples. There are, it's a, it's a great way, a means of like learning by example if you learn that way. There are some other ones in here that are mixed in. This is the unzipped file of the one that's available from bhacker.com. You can go through and you'll see that there's a, there's a couple like Bev, Bez Surface uh, is going to do something interesting. Um, the front, the back, there's a double, there's, there's, there's different examples that are going to have a mixture of lighting, mixture of shading, a mixture of other things. So, um, sometimes it kind of, oh, this is Teswind. Not all of the examples, I will question, I will, I'll actually warn you a little bit. The examples I just showed you work perfectly fine. Not all of the examples in here are going to work depending upon what version of OpenGL you've got. Some of the lighting, the ones that are going to be affected by the lighting and the color 
are slightly different with the more modern, with the more current release. So if it doesn't work, don't don't give up on it. It's still supported. It's just the functions that are being called have been renamed. So, so that's what I wanted to uh, cover today. Was the uh, concept of lighting and shading. Are there any questions? No. Then we're good. We're all done for today. Then I'm not going to hold you for two hours like the last class. <laughs> all right. See you next time. Remember, only uh, three of the five.